الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته Welcome brothers and sisters to another installment of our light study of selected hadith from Riyadh al-Salihin. We are currently in the chapter of repentance and currently commenting on the hadith of the man who killed 99 people. And we've reached the part in the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ, he said, ثُمَّ سَأَلَ أَنْ أَعْلَمِ أَهْلِ الْأَرْضِ فَدُلَّ عَلَى رَجُلٍ عَالِمٍ فَأَتَاهُ فَسَأَلَهُ فَقَالْ إِنَّهُ قَتَلَ مِيَةَ نَفْسٍ فَهَلَّهُ مِنْ تَوْبَةٍ قَالَ نَعَمْ وَمَا يَحُولُ بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَ التَّوْبَةِ إِنْ طَلِقْ إِلَى أَرْضِ كَذَا وَكَذَا فَإِنَّ بِهَا أُنَاسًا يَعْبُدُونَ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى فَاعْبُدُ اللَّهَ مَعَهُمْ وَلَا تَرْجِعِ إِلَى أَرْضِكَ فَإِنَّهَا أَرْضٌ فَإِنَّهَا أَرْضٌ سُوءٌ So in this part of the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ, he said what means later, once again wanting to determine if his forgiveness was possible, the murderous man asked to be directed to the most learned man in the land. This time he was directed to a genuine scholar. He went to the scholar and said, A man has killed 100 people. Is there any chance for his repentance to be accepted? The scholar replied, Why, of course, and what could possibly stand between him and the acceptance of his repentance? Go to such and such land. You will find therein people devoted to prayer and the worship of Allah. Join them in worship and do not return to your land because it is an evil place. So there's a few things in this part of the hadith. Uh, one of them is it clearly shows us the superiority of the scholar over the common worshiper. In the first case, um, he was directed to a monk, a common worshiper, a person who is not scholarly and not in any position to give any type of religious verdict. He may have a scholarly appearance. He may have a pious um uh, a pious attentiveness, a pious level of religious commitment, but he is not a scholar. And so when the person went to that person, he received the wrong answer, and that wrong answer resulted in the demise of that monk. But in the second situation, in the second, um, in the second situation, he went to a scholar, a genuine scholar, and that scholar gave him the correct advice and set him on a path which ultimately resulted in his forgiveness and his salvation. And so this hadith is one of many proofs that illustrates the superiority of the scholars over the non-scholars. And among the uh, other nasus, we could mention, for example, the ayah from Surah um, Az-Zumar, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ هَلْ يَسْتُوا وَالَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Say, are they equal, those who know, and those who know not, none reflects except those of sound intellect. We also have the hadith collected by Imam, I'm sorry, collected by Imam Ahmed, in which the Prophet ﷺ was reported to have said, In the Mathal Ulamai fil Aldi Kamathal Nujumi fil Sama. The likeness of the scholars on earth is that of the stars in the sky. Yuhtada bihafi dhulumat al barri wal bahar. People I'm sorry, through them people are guided in the darkness on land and at sea. فَإِذَا فَإِذَا انطمست النجوم فَإِذَا انطمست النجوم أوشك أن تضل الهدات When the stars are extinguished, in this case meaning the scholars, if there are no scholars, if people are unable to get a hold of the people of knowledge and ask them and seek their guidance and seek their uh, the knowledge that they possess of the religion, people will be on the verge of losing their way. Again, another illustration, another statement from the Prophet Wasallam. It clearly shows the superiority of the scholars over the non-scholars. Another benefit that we take from the hadith um, is that, um, or another thing that we should mention, is how is a scholar recognized? Since we're supposed to ask the scholars, and since asking them is more likely to result in us being guided aright, we should know how the scholars are recognized. Because we talked about yesterday how many people have, a, have an inability to distinguish between the scholar and the non-scholar. The person who looks pious, or the person who actually actually may be pious, but does not have or lacks the religious knowledge and the um, the training to be able to give to get to be able to give fatawa, to be able to give religious verdicts. He may he may be pious in of himself, but he's not qualified to teach. Many people cannot cannot distinguish between that I'm sorry, fail to distinguish between that person and 
And the person who what? Who is truly a qualified, um, a qualified scholar. So how can we recognize the scholars? One way is that the scholars have teachers. Knowledge is something which is passed down from generation to generation, from knowledgeable people to what? To knowledgeable people, right? So this is basically, it's a continuous chain of people who learned from someone, who learned from someone, who learned from someone, who learned from the Prophet So this is the way that knowledge works in Islam. And so one of the ways that we can know the scholar is that he has teachers. He has people who are qualified to teach, who taught him, and then gave him permission to teach what he was taught. As the Prophet said in the Hadith, he said, إِنَّمَا الْعِلْمُ بِالتَّعَلُّمُ Knowledge is only attained through what? Through learning or taking it from the knowledgeable people. We also have the statement of Imam al-Shafi'i, rahimahullah ta'ala, who used to say, مَنْ كَانَ شَيْخُهُ كِتَابَهُ كَانَ خَطَأُهُ أَكْثَرَ مِنْ سَوَابِهِ The one who his only teacher is books. He just reads, he reads, he reads. He's an avid reader. If that's his only source of learning, he doesn't actually have a teacher. Someone who can tell him, yes, this is what the book says, but that's not correct because of this, or that's not the way it should be understood because of that. He doesn't have one, someone to guide him. An actual teacher, he will err more often than he is correct. And this is important too because we have some people who they don't have teachers, but they are avid readers. They do read a lot about Islam. And a lot of people, maybe them, they themselves included, think that that makes them a scholar or makes them an academic or qualifies them to speak about the religion of Allah. No, as a Shafi is pointing out, that reading alone is not enough to make you a scholar. And many people who read a lot, they also make a lot of mistakes because as the Prophet said, إِنَّمَا الْعِلْمُ True knowledge can only be attained by seeking it, taking it, from the knowledgeable people because they are the ones who can correct our misunderstandings of what we read from books. Another, um, another quality by which the scholars are known uh, is that they have sources and their knowledge is sourced. It's traced back to what? To the fundamental sources of the deen. And this is evidenced by the hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ said, فَضْلُ الْعَالِمِ he said the superiority of the scholar over the non-scholar, the avid worshipper, the devoted worshipper who is not a scholar, the virtue or the superiority of the scholar over that person is like the superiority of the moon, the full moon over the rest of the stars. Now, what does this have to do with sourcing and being referring to sources and that a person's statements and opinions are what are sourced? Well, the scholars of Islam, when they studied this hadith, they said that if the Prophet ﷺ really wanted to um, show a disparity, to show, um, you know, to really highlight the disparity between the scholar and the non scholar, the best, best. Um, method would have been the sun versus the stars. Because when the sun is out, you don't see the stars. But the Prophet chose the moon instead. Now the full moon, no doubt, when the full moon is out, the other star, the other, the other constellations, the other heavenly bodies are not as what? It's not as apparent. That the moon eclipses them in a sense, and it's so clear Right, it stands out. It stands on a plane of its own, right, in terms of its brightness. But the thing about the moon is that it, and as opposed to the sun, is that the moon has no light of its own. That the moon's light is something which it derives from what? From the sun, and it reflects the light of the sun. And the prophet used the moon as if to say that the thing about the scholar, the quality of the true scholar, is that he's not telling you things from himself. He's not telling you, I think, I feel, but rather he's telling you, Allah said, and his messenger said, drawing moon, drawing light from what? From the sources of light in the deen of Allah, the Quran and the Sunnah. 
So one of the one of the signs that you know that you're dealing with a genuine scholar is that his opinions are what? They're sourced. His, his opinions are drawn from what? From the Quran and Sunnah. The guidance that he gives you is not his own opinion, but rather opinions which are founded and supported interpretations of the meanings, accurate interpretation of the meanings of the Quran and Sunnah. So this is another quality of the, of the true scholar by which he can be recognized is that his opinions are based upon the religious sources and they are sourced. And the third quality is an extension of that, that the scholar is also known by the fact that he calls to Allah and does not call to himself. And this is another, another problem, this is something we have to look at, that you have people who are always telling you what they think, how they feel, okay, what makes sense to them. But we're not put on this earth to follow what people think and what people feel and what makes sense to them. We're put on this earth to follow what Allah said and His Messenger said, to follow the deen of Allah. And so the scholar will always call you to Allah and not call you to what? To himself. One final quality, not to say that this is a, a exhaustive, uh, comprehensive list, but these are four qualities by which we can what? We can recognize the true scholar. The fourth quality and final one we'll mention today is that the scholar is what? Is someone who is pious. He is a pious person. Him being pious doesn't mean he's perfect, but he's pious. He's not a person who does some of the, um, some of the illicit and lewd and immoral things that certain people are accused of who call themselves ulama. That there are certain things that people do that they, sh that they shouldn't do and that a scholar would not do. Doesn't mean a scholar is perfect, but in general, the scholar is someone who is what? Who is pious. He's not dishonest, he's not a cheat, he's not a thief, etc. and so on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran in Surah Fatir, He said, min ibadihi al -ulama. It is only the true scholars from the slaves of Allah who fear Allah, right? And we also um and so that's one side of it. We know for certain that the scholars, they are people who have piety. They are people who fear Allah. At the same time, on the other side of that coin, is that they're not perfect. Because as the Prophet said in the Hadith, Kullu ibn Adam khatta, every son of Adam, irrespective of how much knowledge he has, will make mistakes. And so the scholars, they may slip up. They're not perfect. But, they're, but, but a person who has this, this quality of being immoral, and it's part and parcel of who he is. It's not a mistake here and there, but a person is what? Is always looking for loopholes. A person is always calling to immorality, speaking immorally and indecently. That's an indication that we're not dealing with a genuine scholar, even if he calls himself an alim and other people, yushiruni ilayhi bil banan. They you know, look up to him and they, you know, they, they respect him and they point him and, and they laud him. That doesn't make him a scholar, if what? if he has this quality of being indecent. Tayyib, so moving on, another issue that these, this part of the hadith addresses is whether or not a person who deliberately kills another person can be forgiven. A person who willfully commits the act of murder, can that person repent and his repentance be accepted and he ultimately be forgiven or not? This is something which has historically been debated by the scholars of Islam. And basically the scholars on this issue are divided into two opinions. The first opinion is that no, absolutely not. The person who kills another believer, another Muslim, and he does so intentionally, that person cannot be forgiven. And this is famously the opinion of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, and is also one of the two opinions which has been attributed to Imam Ahmed rahimahullahu ta'ala. And those two great you know, scholars of this religion have supported their, their position with the ayah from Surah An-Nisa, verse number the fourth chapter, verse number ninety-two, in which Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Wa min yaqatul mu'minan mutaammidan, fajazauhu jahannam, khalidan fiha, wa ghadib Allahu alayhi ila akhir ayah." Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "But whosoever kills a believer intentionally, his recompense is hell, wherein he will abide eternally." So they use this ayah to say that this is the sentence which has been uh, given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the one who kills a believer intentionally, purposefully, deliberately. The second opinion amongst the scholars 
is that yes, a person who kills or commits murder deliberately, kills another believer intentionally, that person can potentially be forgiven. His repentance can potentially be accepted. And this is the opinion of the remaining scholars of Ahl Sunnah, the Sunni scholars from the Sahaba, Ashab Rasulullah, and the jurists the, of the uh, four famous schools of Islamic uh, juristic thought, and the other scholars throughout uh, history have basically basically been of the been of the opinion that one can repent and his repentance to be accepted even from the heinous crime of deliberate, willful commission of murder. And they support their position with this hadith. The hadith of the man who killed 99 people, they support that position by saying this man, ultimately, his, he repented and his repentance was accepted. They also support their, their position with another ayah from Surah Al-Nisa, verse number 48, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna Allah la yaghfir an yushraka bih. Allah forgives not that partners be associated with him, but forgives all other sins to whomever he pleases. And all other sins is general and encompasses the sin of murder. In response to the ayah number 92 from Surah Al-Nisa, what these scholars say is that this statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and whoever kills a believer intentionally, فَجَزَاءُهُ jahannam, his punishment will be or his recompense will be the hellfire, Khalid and Fiha, eternally abiding therein, they say that basically this is Allah mentioning the sentence for a particular deed. This is the sentence for a particular deed. Similar to if a person committed a crime in this world, and a person said, if you do X crime, you are facing 30 years to life. That is the sentence. But this sentence is not necessarily um, a definitive sentence for every specific individual who commits that crime. Meaning that just like in this world, a person could potentially, a person could stand to be punished with a sentence of 30 years to life. They could also be what? They could also be given a lighter sentence. They could also be given probation. They could also be what? Pardoned entirely, right? And so they're saying that similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying is that this is the potential punishment. This is the potential punishment and the general sentence for this crime. But it's not necessarily the sentence that will, that will be meted out for the, for the specific, or for, I'm sorry, for each specific criminal who commits that crime Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is at liberty. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the right to choose to punish or to pardon instead. And that's the meaning of the second ayah in which Allah says, Inna Allah la yaghfir an yushraka bi wa yaghfiru ma duna dhalika li may yasha. Allah does not forgive that partners be associated with him in worship, but he pardons all other sins less than that, less than shirk, and murder is less than shirk. To whomever he pleases. And so the second ayah explains the first ayah. That yes, this is the potential punishment. But Allah may choose to pardon or he may choose to punish. طيب, another uh, benefit that we take from this part of the hadith is that the scholar, the scholar, when he told the murderous man that yes, you can repent, he didn't stop there. He didn't say yes, you can repent. Okay, next. No. He said, yes, you can repent, and then he proceeded to tell him how to go about it. And that's because knowing that repentance is possible is of no benefit without knowledge of the method and how exactly Allah's forgiveness can be achieved. This is important because it's an implicit, uh, an implicit lesson that the Prophet is teaching us that, look, Islam is not just concerned about the why or for whom. It's also concerned with what? The how. And Islam is a religion of methods. It gives us a method for doing things. And if we follow that method, we can hope to what? To achieve our objective from that actual ritual. In this case, repentance. Uh, last but not least from what uh, this particular part of the hadith contains is that the scholar's advice to the man when he gave him instructions on how to repent, it included 
the instruction for the man to change his environment, instructing the man to change his environment. And that is because, brothers and sisters, people are products, generally speaking, are products of their environment and highly influenced by the company they keep. As the Prophet said in the Hadith, he said, A person will generally follow the faith of his closest companions, right? The people that he associates with. So consider carefully who you take as a friend. So what the basically what the scholar is basically saying in, in, in a roundabout way or the hadith is teaching us is that even if the person, this man in this case, or any of us repented successfully, if we remain in the evil place and keep company, continue to keep company with evil associates, that will likely cause us to relapse. We are more likely to relapse and return to the sin, return to criminal activity, could be the same exact sin, in this case murder or some other sin. But if you're in an evil place, surrounded by evil people, you're, you're likely to commit what? To, to commit evil deeds, to commit evil acts. And so to avoid this, we have to remove ourselves from the environment and dissociate, disassociate ourselves from those evil companions. What lessons can we learn, brothers and sisters, from what we heard today from the hadith of Abi Sayyid al-Khudri about the man who killed 99 people? We took a portion of it. What lessons can we take from that portion? One lesson is we learn clearly why our, we, we see a clear, um, the, we, we see from a, certain, from a certain perspective, we see the reasoning behind our religion ordering us to ask the people of knowledge. Why? Because they're superior. Because they are in a better position to what? To answer the questions that they're asked. Because they're more qualified. And, and that makes sense to us in every other discipline. It should certainly make sense to us in the discipline of Dean. That when I, when I, when I have an, a question about medicine, I go to the person who's a specialist in medicine because he's more qualified to answer that question. And when I have a question about the plumbing in my house, I don't go to the doctor because he's not as qualified as the plumber, even though he has more training and more schooling and, he has, and his job carries more prestige. In this particular issue, he's not more qualified, the plumber is more qualified to speak authoritatively and credibly about what should be done. Same thing here, we ask the scholar because he's more qualified and more capable. And finally, we ask the scholar um, because Allah wants us to be guided and not to be misguided. And in these matters, no one is better capable, more capable, I'm sorry, more capable to guide us than the scholar. As, um, you know, as the Arab proverb, it says, The person who doesn't have something cannot give it to others. The person who has no knowledge cannot give knowledge to others. The person who does not know where he is going cannot possibly guide others. And this is analogous to, for example, a blind person trying to guide people uh, across, to help people cross the street. Nobody would have a blind person be their, um, their crossing guard. But for whatever reason, brothers and sisters, when it comes to Dean, we're perfect. We're prepared to ask people who are basically spiritually blind, right? And this is misguidance. So we see from this hadith why our religion says, ask the people of knowledge. Another lesson we take from the hadith is we learn some of the qualities by which the true scholars can be recognized. We learn that one of their qualities is piety and the fear of Allah. Another piety is, that, I'm sorry, another quality is that they always are supporting their opinions with the Qur'an and the Hadith, and their opinions are always sourced. It's never just opinion, but it's always opinion because Allah said, because His Messenger said. We also learn that they call to Allah. The true scholars, they always call to Allah. They don't call to themselves. Another quality we learned about was that these scholars have teachers who have authorized, who have endorsed them, and authorized them to what? To teach others what they have learned. Number three from the lessons, is we learn from the hadith um, that one of the indications that, um, I'm sorry, this hadith is one of the indications that even the sin of deliberate murder can and will be forgiven if a person who, if the person who commits it sincerely repents. And last but not least from the lessons for today is repentance without changing environment and changing associates will likely be short-lived. Brothers and sisters, we're all sinners. We all make mistakes. We all have our transgressions. The Prophet said so, and the Prophet said so truthfully. Kulub ni Adam khatta. 
all the sons of Adam are sinners, all the sons of Adam make mistakes. And as we try to repent from our sins, we have to understand that we are products, oftentimes, products of our environment, and the sins we commit are the result of the environments in which we find ourselves. And so if we want to be better, if we want to truly repent and have a lasting repentance where we don't return to these sins and um, get ourselves in more trouble or, or basically take a step forward and two steps back, then part of that process is changing our environment and changing the associates, the people that we are around. If you uh, are repenting, for example, from drinking alcohol and you keep going to bars, you're going to relapse. If you're repenting from smoking and you're hanging around people who smoke cigarettes all the time, you're going to relapse. And so we have to understand that it's not enough just to check you know, three boxes, and we mentioned the um, three conditions for repentance in previous lessons. We, don't, we can't think, I'll just check these three boxes and everything will be fine. There's a fourth box that we have to check. And that is changing the environment, as we see clearly from this hadith, where the scholar told the man, "In So he told him, he said, "Go to such and such land. There are pious people there. They worship Allah. Go and worship Allah with them, and do not return to your land. It is an evil place." Because why? Because people are products of their environments and people are oftentimes, more often than not, influenced by the company they keep. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who listen to the talk and follow the best of it. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who he teaches beneficial knowledge. And who he truly benefits from the knowledge that he teaches us by making us from those who put it into practice. Ameen, ameen, ya rabbal alameen, wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak. Anabir Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.